we acknowledge the Tasmania Aboriginal people as the traditional custodians of this land and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and future who hold the memories, traditions, culture and hope of Tasmania's First Peoples. Libraries Tasmania also pays respect to the resilience and strength of the Tasmanian Aboriginal people and extends that respect to all First Australian peoples. And I think we have a special guest who's going to introduce Kate. Yes, so special. Bye from the special guest. My name is Amanda Vojtovic. For those of you who don't know me, and I'm the president of the Friends of the Allport, which is why I generally introduce the photo talks. But this has been combined with a history work talk as well. Thank you, Sandra, Thank for you. helping us with this. And we've got a good crowd. Oh, we've got a lovely crowd, haven't we? We have indeed. Um, now, I remember introducing Kate at the first in this very special and very interesting series um, by saying that I thought I knew her, but it turned out that I didn't at all. She was not just the curious person and the excitable person at the desk, but that she had several degrees, Bachelor's of Arts, Bachelor's of Education, Associate Degree in Social Sciences. She was a family history diploma researcher. She was a record management and archive person. And she had been the director of boarding at Collegiate School, which is interesting because Joan Orport was the librarian there. Joan being a direct relative of Curzon. said Curzon. Mm. So that makes a very nice little connection. And the first in this series of lectures about Curzon uh, introduced him and his character, I would have to say, and the fact that he had been quite scandalous in relation to the Tasmanian community mm -hmm. uh, and had divorced his first wife, attempted to, attempted to divorce, yeah, yes, t attempted to divorce his, his real wife Annie, had had several other children as it happened, um, but Annie's children were well, only one? He only had one. Uh, he only had one other, but he had several other liaisons and he might have had other <laughs> this is correct, we do not know. That's right. And uh, so Kate agreed, because we were all so excited at that time about this, this interesting man, that we would have some more in the sequence. This is the second, which introduces some very interesting aftermaths of the early scandalous behaviour of Curzon Orbul. Thank you, Amanda. That was very kind. Thanks, Amanda. Can we turn the lights off? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, yes, as Amanda said, this is, it is a standalone talk, so you don't have to have heard the first one. Um, if you wanted to, I can show people how to get to that at the end if people are interested, but we will go on. So people often ask me why we don't have very many original items from the Allport family who arrived in Van Diemen's Land in 1831. It is my hope that this talk will help to explain why that is and expose the complex dynamics which often exist in so many families. It will focus on Curzon Allport, his son Dudley, I call him Dastardly Dudley, and his nephew Cecil, who was the son of Curzon's older brother, Morton. So for the benefit of those who haven't heard the first part of Curzon's story, I'll just give a little bit of background for context. So Curzon Allport was born in Hobart in 1837. The second surviving son of Joseph and Mary Morton Allport, he had an older brother, Morton, with whom he was in constant one-sided competition. I don't think Morton bought into it that much, but Curzon certainly did. He had a sister, Mary Louise, known as Minnie, and a younger brother, Evett. Curzon Allport married Annie Houston in 1864 and the couple had three children who survived to adulthood. They had Dudley Francis Curzon Allport, Sybil Annie, or Annie Sybil, depending on how you look at it, she was known as just plain Sybil, and John Roberts, known as Jack Allport. Morton Allport married Elizabeth Ritchie in 1856 and the couple had six children, including the artist Curzona Francis Louise or Lily and her elder brother, Mark Morton, John, or Cecil Allport. So Cecil's our main player in this game. 
Mortimer and Cecil both followed their father into the law profession with Morton joining the family firm, or Port and Roberts, in Hobart and Curzon setting up his practice in Melbourne, perhaps in an attempt to remove himself from his father and brother's shadows. During this period, Morton would write many letters to Curzon urging him to return home or at least send Annie and the children over for a visit. However, Curzon made the trip home very rarely during this time. During the decade of the 1870s, Mary Morton Allport, their mother, was to suffer the loss of her husband Joseph in 1877 and the unexpected death of two of her children, daughter Minnie at sea in July 1871, son Morton in September 1878, and her grandson, Francis John Maitland Frankie Reed. He died in March 1872, a short eight months after his mother Minnie's death. Through letters from Morton Allport, written in the months following Minnie's death in 1871 and Joseph's death in 1877, we know that the grief suffered by Mary Morton Allport after the death of her only daughter and husband was great indeed, and only compounded when, arguably, her favourite son Morton died within months of his father. The deaths of his father and brother left a vacancy at the head of the Allport family, a vacancy Curzon was eager to fill. Sending his wife Annie and their children to her family in New Norfolk, Curzon returned to Hobart and set up home at a cottage on the grounds of the family home, Aldridge Lodge. Um, so Aldridge Lodge is a uh, family home, so Mary Morton and Joseph's home. It's um, in Elbowden Street, which was known as Holbrook Street at the time that they lived there in the early part, and it's now Jane Franklin Hall, well, part of Jane Franklin Hall, where his bereaved, widowed, and mother Mary Morton Allport also lived. He also took over his brother's place in the family law firm, Allports and Roberts. Curzon had thus successfully positioned himself in places of power and his manipulations of his mother and practice partner, John Roberts, began. For the first few years, Curzon and his nephew, Cecil, who was also a lawyer, worked in relative harmony at the firm, navigating their business requirements and trying to settle the affairs of both their fathers. That was until that fateful time in 1883 when Curzon unsuccessfully attempted to divorce his wife Annie. No one really knows why, no one really knows for sure why Curzon decided to divorce his wife. However, Cecil has it on good authority that it was because he wanted to marry a young lady in New Norfolk, a Miss Jeffries. I've been on trying to track down Miss Jeffries, I haven't yet. I've got a few ideas, but in order to obtain a divorce, Corson brought suit against his wife, accusing her of adultery and intemperance. Annie, in reply, denied the allegations and filed a countersuit in which she accuses Curzon of adultery, cruelty, <coughs> excuse me, cruelty, abuse and intemperance. The trial was set for November 1883. During that trial, we note that Curzon had fathered an illegitimate child, Francis Curzon Orport Clampett, with his and Annie's children's nurse, Anne Clampett. In 1869, the child died in childhood, unfortunately. He had numerous affairs. He would beat Annie when he had been drinking, and he frequented assignation houses while living in Melbourne. I do love an assignation house. So there we go. So that photo there of Curzon, that photo was actually used during um, the divorce proceedings. It was taken to, yeah, it was taken to Melbourne. So they obviously lived in Melbourne before returning to Hobart. And that was shown around the local ladies of the night and members at the Assignation House. Do you recognise this gentleman? And if so, when, how, and why? So that's why I call it his divorce photo. <laughs> Um, after a harrowing number of days in court where his wife was thoroughly humiliated, this is his wife Annie. That's a close up of Annie's face. Now, this is the only identified photo that we have of Annie in our collection. There may be others that haven't been identified, but that is the only one that's been identified. I think she looks quite. Yeah, she looks like she's in absolute despair there, doesn't she? So after thoroughly humiliating his wife and his family and embarrassing his family, Curzon's suit was eventually withdrawn when it became apparent that he could not prove his case, while his wife Annie had more than proved hers. At the conclusion of the trial, Cecil wrote the following to one of his uncles, Richie, in Launceston, so that was his mother's side of the family, the Richies. Curzon then left that court a branded man, blacker a thousand times than when he had entered it. 
for he was proved beyond question to be an adulterer, a wife beater, and a drunkard, the most filthy and disgusting character. The schism between nephew and uncle was set. Curzon Allport, full of the Allport charm, according to one of his obituaries, appears to have picked up his life and carried on as if the scandal had never happened. The hurt and mortification he caused his wife and family a mere smudge on his copybook, something to be easily ignored and moved on from. He, Curzon, is lost to all sense of decency and shame. He holds his head higher than he ever did and he stays here at the family firm to proclaim his innocence and he has dragged the names and he has dragged the names of our good mother and sister through the dirt and cast a slur on the whole family such as it never had before, Cecil writes to his uncle Richie. Cecil found it increasingly unbearable to continue to work in the same office as his now infamous uncle. It seemed to Cecil that the right thing to do after bringing his family and therefore the family firm into disrepute was to have Curzon leave the firm. Little did, Curzon, little did Cecil know that Curzon had begun his campaign of manipulations of both Roberts and his mother, Mary Morton Norport, in order to maintain at the firm and push Cecil out. It appears Uncle Curzon was not above inducing Granny to write to Mr Roberts, begging that he would not send Curzon away. I hear he is jubilant at my leaving, but it can't be helped, he wrote. Family firms established when, upon the retirement of Joseph Orport's first partner, George Cartwright, John Roberts partnered with, with Joseph to form Orport and Roberts in 1841. Joseph's son Morton then joined the firm in 1855 and it became Orport, Roberts and Orport. Cecil followed his father Morton and grandfather Joseph into the profession and also joined the firm, the firm upon his admission as a solicitor. Curzon, meanwhile, chose not to draw in the family firm and his dead set up practice in Melbourne in 1863. Given his grandfather, father and he himself had been part of the firm from its inception onwards, one could see how Cecil might expect some loyalty from the ageing Roberts as he navigated the rocky fallout from Curzon's scandal of 1883. After all, once Curzon had completed his articles with the firm, he then left, I imagine with the intention of never really returning to the family firm. He did, however, name his second son after John Roberts, which must have pleased Roberts immensely. immensely. But was it enough to override the loyalty shown by three generations of Allports to the firm and Roberts himself? Surely the world would sympathise with, sympathise with me when driven away through no fault of mine from the business in which my father and grandfather lived and died, Cecil wrote. When Cecil approached John Roberts in the aftermath of the 1883 divorce trial, he pleaded with him to expel Curzon based on his bad character and the stain he has brought to the firm. Cecil cannot in good conscience continue to work with such a man as Curzon has proven to be and wants him out. He writes to his uncle Richie, no one will hardly speak to him in the street and many who are forced to do business with, business with him in the office do it with regret. Mr Roberts has allowed Curzon to continue in the firm I cannot allow myself to be identified with Curzon for one day longer. Curzon, it would seem, had been busy himself since that November day in 1883 when his case was withdrawn. He requested his mother, Mary Morton Allport, speak to John Roberts and plead his case. Now, Curzon had remained living at Aldridge Lodge, or at least on the grounds, since his return to Hobart. He had had ample opportunity and time to spend with his elderly mother and no doubt ingratiate himself with her as one of her only two surviving children. I suspect this would not have been hard to do for a man as clever and manipulative and charming as Curzon. His only other surviving sibling, Ebert, was away in the country for extended periods and was known to have some issues of his own, which we will get into later. Cecil sees no option but to leave the family firm and go out on his own. He writes to his mentor and friend, John Roberts, you are aware of the estrangement between my uncle Curzon and myself and the causes that led to it. So as not to discredit my poor father's name, I have no alternative but to withdraw from the partnership into which you so graciously brought me nearly two years ago, two and a half years ago, and it is better to get this wretched business over with as, with as little delay as possible. This choice will have dire personal consequences for the young solicitor and cement his uncle Curzon's position in power both professionally and within the family. To have the respected John Roberts and his mother, the esteemed Mary Morton Allport, publicly support him was to effectively shut down the scandal. Essentially, a nothing to see here, people, move on moment. The scandal of the divorce trial should have seen Curzon blacklisted in, and shunned in Victorian Hobart society 
and for a few weeks it did. People crossed the street to avoid him, but it was short-lived. I crossed the street too, but it's not over. Curzon's life continued as it had been, in spite of the damage he had left in his wake. He set up his mistress in full view of his mother. Yes, he moved his girlfriend into the house. <laughs> Sent his wife, Annie, back to New Norfolk, where she remained in semi-seclusion until the early 1900s. Their sons, Dudley and Jack, stayed with their father and worked at the family firm, while daughter Sybil went between her parents, but stayed mainly in Hobart at Aldridge Lodge. Cecil's mother, Elizabeth, so the widow of Curzon's brother, Morton, and siblings left for England and all for university, leaving Cecil to manage not only his mother's affairs, but the fallout from the scandal alone. He had no real confidence, save for his uncles, Henry and William Ritchie in Launceston. Cecil was also to suffer the loss of his fiancée, Georgie Fawns, in Launceston, whose mother broke off their understanding when Cecil left the firm to start out on his own. Cecil must have felt abandoned by all who should have stood by him. His principle would stand against what he believed was wrong and seeing, was seeing him essentially punished and pushed out of his Allport family. By the time of Mary Morton Allport's death in 1895, the divisions within the family were looking to be irreparable. Curzon and his son Dudley, dastardly Dudley, had their claws firmly into Mary Morton Allport without outside influence. They lived with her and had her at their mercy. Mary Morton Allport did still have contact with Cecil and his siblings in town, however this appears to have been somewhat limited. Whether she wanted to be or not, Mary Morton was firmly in the Curzon camp. Mary Morton's only other surviving child, Evett, who was also drawn into Curzon's camp. Evett was often away from home, Aldridge, or Aldridge Lodge, tending to the family property in the northeast of Tasmania. When he was home, however, Everett was an easy target for the manipulative Curzon. Everett was a man fighting his own demons. Stilwell has referred to him as not quite the full shilling, although his school, you know, although his school records and Mary Morton's journals would dispute this. I would suggest that his perceived defects were more of his own making rather than by birth. Curzon, through his son Dudley and the firm, would also take control of the outstanding matters of Joseph Walport's will. So this is uh, Joseph Walport, so Curzon's father and Cecil's grandfather, which included provisions made for his sons and their eventual widows. So this is to do mainly with um, Cecil's mother, Elizabeth. You see, despite Joseph nominating his own executors and trustees, including Mr. George Alexander Webster, who will play a part in this role a bit later, Dudley became a trustee, much to the objection of Cecil and his siblings and mother. They repeatedly told Mr Webster that Dudley needed to resign his position. In a letter dated the 7th of June 1895, Cecil writes to his mother about Dudley and Dudley's handling of Joseph's estate. As to grandfather's estate, they are going far from smoothly and are rapidly approaching a climax. Mr. Roberts has now refused to furnish further amounts or to go into matter before, matters before 1875. Dudley, moreover, has refused to resign as trustee. Mr. Webster has written to both Mr. R and Dudley very strongly and evidently does not mean to put up with any nonsense. Mr. R's conduct is most discreditable. His position is quite untenable and places him in an enviable light. I told Mr. Webster a few days ago that we would apply to the court to remove Dudley from the trusteeship unless he vacated it. Cecil also reveals that, quote, Dudley was speaking to Russell, so Russell is one of Cecil's brothers, about the way they, Dudley and Curzon, intended to cut up property for sale after the termination of poor Granny's life interest. They take charge of it as if everything belongs to them. What Cecil did not know at the time of writing the above to his mother was that Mary Morton had already taken ill. Dear mother, you will be surprised and grieved to hear that poor old Granny was taken ill last Friday, he writes to Elizabeth Allport on the 14th of June, 1895, and passed away quietly a few days later. We were quite unaware then that she was unwell. Indeed, we knew nothing about it till Sunday evening when Russell, who had been told by Mr Webster, came up and told us. And I think that says quite a lot about the character of both Curzon and Dudley, that neither of them felt the need to inform Cecil or his family that she was so ill. Cecil does, however, concede that everything that could be done was done for Mary Morton's her final days. 
And so with the death of Mary Morton Allport that June in 1895, the careful plans Curzon and his son Dudley had been laying for years could now be set in motion. Cecil tells his mother that Aldrich Lodge, the family home, would have to be sold to satisfy the estate and bequests made by Joseph Allport's will. So when Joseph died, he left um, the property, the home and the property and all the furnishings to Mary Morton Allport for the comfort of and for her life. And once she died, it was to be divided up between the sons and all their widows. Cecil relays to his mother that Granny spoke to Russell about the sale, saying that she hoped the house and grounds in front would stay in the family and be bought by one of the Allports. She also said that Curzon could not buy it, but that I might do so. Cecil confides to his mother that he would like to do so should it be possible. Surprisingly, he also reveals that Curzon came to speak to me and he said he would rather I bought it than anyone and he hoped that I would. Now this could be seen as a magnanimous gesture on Curzon's behalf. However, knowing his character and what is to come, I would suggest that this is part of his plan. He plans to see and give Cecil hope that he could fulfil Mary Morton's wishes and keep Aldridge Lodge in his family, only to rip that hope away in the coming days and weeks once the contents of Mary Morton Allport's will is made known. I have been surprised to hear that Granny made a will giving all her property to Curzon, Everett and Curzon's children. I hardly thought that the pictures of you and father and father's paintings would have been left to that crowd. I believe all pictures go to Curzon. I suppose it is not her will, but the will of those who influenced her. Now those pictures are, are, are interesting. So they're pictures that Morton, so Cecil's father, had painted of his mother and some other things. And, um, Lizzie, so um, Cecil's mother, wanted them back. She believed that they were just lent to Mary Morton Allport. They weren't actually hers to give away in her will. And um, Curzon's like, no, you're not getting them. He's hanging on to them. Now, I have my own reasons as to why I think he wants to hang on to those, especially ones of um, Lizzie. But we will... that's pure speculation on my behalf. Anyway, so that's, um, Lizzie. So that's a picture of Elizabeth with baby Cecil. In this letter, Cecil is clearly alleging that Mary Morton was heavily influenced by Curzon and Dudley as to what she wrote in her will. The will, of course, which was to favour them and leave nothing to anybody else save for a few small bequests for Mary Morton's niece and companion, Sarah Edwards, now her family's interesting, her surviving grandchild by Minnie, grandchildren by Minnie, George, Charlie and Emmy Reed, and perhaps somewhat surprisingly to Cecil's brother, Russell. In his letter to his mother dated the 21st of June, 1895, Cecil outlines the terms of Mary Morton's will and details how her property is to be divided between her heirs. He also spells out his thoughts on the character and actions of Curzon and Dudley. This is an abbreviated version of that letter. That's Mary Morton's will. Dear Mother, I am sorry to say that Curzon, the Curzon crowd are already showing that their desire is to manage everything and get all they can regardless of the interests of others. I have known for years past that Curzon was a rogue, but I hardly thought he would have acted in the manner as he has already. To begin at the beginning, on the night poor Granny died, Curzon came to my house at about 10.30pm. I was going to bed. He knocked. I went down to him. He had never been to my house before. He came in and told me the sad news which had reached me an hour before by telephone. He then spoke about the property. He said that I should buy it. I asked him what he thought it was worth. He said the whole 10 acres would not bring more than 3,000 pounds. I said, oh, surely it will. And he said, you should buy that. You ought to have it as the eldest son of the eldest son. I said I did not see how I could buy it at present. And he said, oh, do try and buy it. As far as I'm concerned, you can have any terms you like to pay it, and I feel sure Everett will give you any terms as regards to his share. I said, do you really wish for me to buy it and live there? And he said, I do indeed. Here is my hand on it. And he stretched out his hand across the fireplace beside which we were sitting and shook hands with me. That was late on Monday night. Sunday, I heard for the first time that a scheme was afoot for Everett to buy the property, not to live in for himself or anything of that kind, but practically for Curzon and his family. I felt uneasy about this, and on Monday morning, Mr Webster came to my office and broached the subject. He said Everett, Curzon and Dudley had been to see him, and they were very anxious to buy the property. 
that Everett's money would buy it and that they were willing to buy it at a fair price. I said, would you propose to put it up, meaning for auction? Mr Webster said, oh no, they want to buy it privately without any auction. I said, have you the power to do this under the will? And Mr Webster said, yes, but he would not allow it to be done if anyone interested objected. I said, I object most strongly. If they want the property, they need to buy it at auction. Curzon, Dudley the trustee who ought to be doing his best by the property, and the whole fraternity seem to me to be running down the place all they can and making out everything against it because they want to get it as cheaply as they can. Granny has left a will, all pictures of Curzon, all, all pictures to Curzon, all books to Evett, sketchbooks equally between Curzon and Evett, £25 to Evett, £25 to George Reed, Emmy Reed and Charlie Reed, and £400 to Aunt Sarah, with the residue being equally divided between Russell, Dudley and Jack, who, the Jack who's Curzon's other son. Of course, this is not dear old Granny's will as much as the will of those who influenced her, but the whole thing is contemptible in the extreme. I certainly, I certainly never dreamed of her leaving me anything, and I certainly would never have wanted anything, but nonetheless, I despise Curzon and his children for the way they have worked for themselves. Granny always thought she was very poor and told Minnie, so this is Minnie Cecil's sister, so frequently, told Minnie so frequently. Minnie was very concerned about it. And it now turns out that she, Mary Morton, had accumulated about 2,200 pounds of money, and I very much doubt whether she ever knew it. It seems much more probable that those who knew the contents of her will gave her as little income as they could put off with, put off with and, and accumulated the rest, knowing it would come to them before long. It's an indictment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Dudley is going to marry and live in the old family home. Sybil, Curzon's daughter, will live with them. Curzon will do ditto having his little cottage as at present. And all this is to be done with poor old Ebbett's money. He being, as you know, quite unable to manage business affairs or even take care of what he has got and see that he gets his own. Everett is to be sent back to the country and as Dudley coolly said, if Everett gets £100 a year, he'll be satisfied, knowing quite well, as he does, that Everett is entitled to at least two to £250 a year. Of course, they mean to simply take the rest of his money. The contempt Cecil has for Curzon and Dudley and their actions is highlighted by this letter. He accuses Curzon and Dudley of the financial abuse of Mary Morton in her final years and highlights their greed and the lengths that they will go to to get what they want. If we trust what Cecil says is true, then Mary Morton's own son deprived her of all the comforts to a woman of her age and position, a grave indictment on his character indeed. On the 19th of June, Cecil wrote to his brother-in-law, Tom Steele, so that's the husband of his sister, Minnie, in a confidential letter in which he states, I am sorry to say the crowd up the street are acting in a very peculiar way. They had everything ready, cut and dried, that day after you left town. The property, Aldridge Lodge, was to be bought with poor old Everett's money and they were to live in the house while Everett was to be relayed back to his country seat. Mr Webster saw me and said that Curzon and Dudley had been to see him and they were prepared to buy it at a fair price, Everett being the purchaser. That's Everett. One picture of Everett. Now remember, Everett is the brother of Curzon and Cecil's of Curzon and Cecil's deceased father Morton. He is a troubled man who appears to have had a drinking problem. With the death of his mother, Mary Morton, he is left without protection and is easy prey for the clever and manipulative older brother. Cecil writes to his mother, poor old Everett is well watched and I believe keeps fairly straight, though it is reported that about a fortnight ago or three days he was on a spree. He is quite sure to break out periodically. On the 6th of March, 1886, he writes again, you will not be surprised to hear that old Everett is giving trouble. In fact, he's breaking out as it was to be expected. On that same day, March the 6th, 1896, Cecil writes to his other brother, Gordon, sharing more detail of how Everett has broken out. Everett must be got out of town, on the booze, very bad, all day and night, dug out of the Globe, so um, the Globe Hotel on the corner of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Daily Street and Antill Street, which was literally, you know, stone's throw from the house. Uh, at eight the next morning, poor old chap, they'll have it all out of him. 
It's a lovely sizzle. <laughs> he's there, he's there. Throughout all of this, Cecil has been working with his siblings in an attempt to have his mother buy an Aldridge Lodge and move back home from England with his sisters. It is actually quite heartbreaking to read the letters in which Cecil is beseeching his mother to acquiesce to this plan. At the auction of Aldridge, as the auction of Aldridge Lodge draws closer, Cecil sees his dreams of his mother and siblings being able to buy the home dissipate. Curzon is determined to have Aldridge Lodge and the land surrounding it. He has plans, our Curzon, and they do not include Cecil or any of his family. The underhanded behaviour over the sale of Aldridge Lodge and treatment of Mary Morton Allport before her death is the final straw for, for Cecil, his older sister Minnie, and her husband Tom Steele. They are very much annoyed at the way Curzon and his lot have behaved. I certainly will have nothing more to do with them, Cecil writes to his mother. A split which may have only been a split during 1883 was now cavernous. They are most definitely a family divided. It's Dudley, doesn't it? Dudley. <laughs> Dudley, I am sorry to say, has proved since Granny's death that he is a greater rogue as his father. In fact, the only difference between them is that he has the disadvantage of also being a fool. <laughs> nice one, Cecil. Before the auction, Curzon is seen to be putting up other potential buyers by having Mary Morton's niece and companion, Sarah Edwards, who had remained at the property as caretaker along with Dudley and Curzon, point out all the defects in the property. <laughs> yeah, look, there's a crack in that sink over there. Look, you need to put heating in, and there's no inside bathrooms. He also had hopes that this would influence the value of Mr. Bevan into setting a low price for Aldridge Lodge. Mr. Bevan had previously gone thoroughly over the property on our behalf and inspected the buildings. This report as to those was completely at variance with the statement made by Curzon and Dudley. <laughs> Curzon may have wanted the family home and property, but he doesn't, but he wasn't willing to pay for it. Cecil was not going to stand for this. If he was to lose the home, then by God he was going to make Curzon and Dudley pay for it. If they want to buy that property in this their dirty way, they shall and must be made to pay for it, he writes to his mother. There's another picture of Everett. Mm. Mm. So what of Everett, the other player in this game? To hear Cecil tell it, Everett was firmly under the control of Curzon, yet Cecil holds out some hope that he is able to see through Curzon's machinations. In a letter to his mother, he writes, You'll be delighted to hear that I have reason to think Everett has already found out what Curzon and his family are after. They have shepherded him everywhere, Jack, so Curzon's other son, was up from the coast to act watching in Curzon's absence, and the poor fellow was never let out of their sight. He was brought down that night before the sale and has been in town ever since. Neither Russell nor I had a chance on seeing him. If he went out, one or the other accompanied him. Two days ago, Russell wrote, some, wrote him some lines at my dictation, saying that he swears he, Everett, was, he is, sorry, that Everett was going to Southernfield, which is the home of Tom and Minnie Steele. He was going to deliver something to them. Everett called the next day at Russell's, but he did not get a chance to say a word. Russell was down at the train this morning, and just as it was leaving, he jumped into the carriage and went as far as Glenorchy. He then told Everett quite enough about Curzon and Dudley to satisfy most people, and old Everett practically told he saw through it all and knew what they were after. He said, moreover, that the property was his and that he was master and they were not, and that he would not sign anything without having independent advice. Bravo, Everett. I never thought he had so much sense. If he can only keep quiet and leave off taking too much liquor, he may live years and years, may live years and years. Their object was to get everything fixed up and then let him drink himself to death. The sooner, the better. The old chap has apparently seen through their schemes and they may have overreached themselves after all. I only hope Everett may have the brains enough to insist on getting what he is entitled to. Cecil may have accepted the loss of Aldridge Lodge and his dream of having his mother and siblings return home and live out their lives there, but he was not about to let the manner in which Curzon and Dudley obtained it go. In particular, his concern for his uncle Everett is evident when he writes to his mother in October 1895. Tom and Minnie have been in town and they are very much annoyed with Curzon, Dudley and the whole crowd and have nothing at all to do with them. We have been most disgracefully treated throughout. They are busy now, trading on Everett. 
I hear the property is to be conveyed to trustees when Dudley will be one for Everett's benefit. This will be a stepping stone to robbing the poor old fellow of it. They will see no doubt that he cannot mount mortgage or sell it and that after it's his death it goes into the Curzon family. Then perhaps he may try and poison poor Everett as he did his own wife. So as part of um, Annie Allport's countersuit to the divorce trial, she accused Curzon of drugging her um, in an attempt not to probably kill her, but he was trying to plant false memories about an affair. So he'd have her sort of half conscious and he'd whisper things in her ear while she was lying there. Yeah. None of us will ever go inside that place again. Do not think I regret not having the place. It suits me far better as things are. He worked the opposition admirably and I made them pay dearly for it. So that is a picture of Aldridge Lodge. It's circa about 1870, I believe the record says. And the two figures down the front have been identified as Cecil and his sister Minnie. Again, a few days later, on the 18th of October, he writes, Thank goodness I washed my hands of them long since. Poor old Everett has been fleeced to rights. They mean to have everything out of him and no doubt will succeed. It is common talk outside. The property around Aldridge Lodge was also to be sold. Again, Curzon and Dudley had specific plans for that property. They wanted to remain a right of way through part of the property for the exclusive use of those who owned Aldridge Lodge, so themselves. And therefore, it was not to be part of the land sale. This was not agreed to by Cecil and the other interested parties. So this is a map. Oh, where's my little pointer? Where am I? There I am. So initially, the property, so that's Joseph's property there, corner of the it. So the southern outlet is there now. Yeah, 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 that way. Am I going the right way? Yeah. Um, and the property initially went right down to almost where Fitzroy Gardens is, that kind of area, into the Dunern sort of area. And that was the part of the land that was um, disputed, shall we say. Inspecting the place, and to my astonishment, I found that in defiance of my agreement and in direct breach of Mr Webster's instructions, they had endeavoured to cheat us by reserving a right of way over this for Aldridge Lodge people. I at once got hold of Mr Webster, called his attention to it, and he was exceedingly annoyed and saw Curzon. I heard the latter telling Mr Webster it made no difference, and I told Mr Webster that if the sale was allowed to proceed on such lines, I would be taking proceedings and file a bill of equity in the Supreme Court. I further told Mr Webster in presence of in presence of we'll get to that in, a in presence of Dudley, his co-trustee Curzon, Ebert and several others, that it was a deliberate attempt to commit a fraud and that he knew that it was a departure from our agreement. Mr Webster was very good over the whole matter and insisted on having it put straight. He not only did this, but gave Curzon a good raking for his treachery. Nothing one can say of Curzon's villainy is too strong. I can believe anything of him now. <coughs> On the 13th of March, 1896, Cecil writes to his mother, the Curzon crowd are now endeavouring to get old Everett back into the country. Aunt Sarah has been got rid of and is now on her way back to England. Sybil, so it is said, is going into some hospital in Melbourne as a nurse, and when Everett is discarded, Dudley, I suppose, will get married and occupy Everett's home rent-free. Curzon continuing on in the cottage. They are a most despicable crowd. Not that now that poor Everett's money is in the property, he will be discarded straight. Before that, nothing was too good for him. It was to be his home for life. Those who had been living in Aldridge Lodge were of no further use to Curzon and Dudley. They had served their purpose and were now removed, leaving Curzon and Dudley to survey their domain and go about their lives with little care or thought for Cecil and his side. So that's my beautiful arrows. So the green one, that is Dudley. And the blue one, that is Curzon. He's a rather short gentleman, isn't he? Mm -hmm. There he is. So that, um, yeah, circa 1890s. The actual record says circa 1900s, but um, Curzon was dead by then, so this is a ghost. Could have been suppose. Yeah, so he's not a... Look at that face. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm not suggesting that the two sides of the family never saw each other from this point. 
Indeed, as we know, Hobart is a small place. When you share a profession, undoubtedly, Curzon, Cecil and Dudley had contact. Lily, so Cecil's sister, even painted a portrait of their cousin Sybil. There it is. Um, and there is speculation that Curzon bought some of Lily's works and that the two had reconciled during the late 1890s. Stilwell, um, Geoffrey Stilwell, so the original curator of the Orpal collection after Henry died, um, he recollects he did an oral history and he was saying that um, he heard Joan, he knew Joan Orpal, who was Curzon's um, granddaughter, and she, he, she would speak very fondly of Lily and also Lily's younger sister, Mary. So these are, these are Cecil's siblings. And he, she was very affectionate about those. So we have to agree that there, there was some family interaction. I don't know how Cecil felt about that. But there are two most definitely, there, were, there most definitely were two separate sides to the Allport family and by default, two collections. Curzon had what he wanted, the house, the land, and many of Mary Morton Allport's treasures, artworks, books, and furniture, which would pass down his line through Dudley. Cecil held on to his father's collection of artworks, natural science specimens, those which weren't donated to TMAG, maps and books. He built on this collection, as did his son Henry, and it has become what is now the Allport Library and Museum of Fine Arts. The law firm Cecil established with John Mitchell and Henry Dobson in 1887, Dobson Mitchell Allport, continues today be without any Allports, while Roberts and Allports, that family firm, ceased to exist beyond the early 1900s. Curzon's legacy crumbled into dust, much like the house he schemed so hard to obtain. In the hours that followed, Cur sorry, in the years that followed, Curzon built a grand home on the property acquired from the Mary Morton Allport estate sale. Ever bought it, he just got it from The house, Nun Oin, and I've probably pronounced that very incorrectly, it's a Tasmanian Aboriginal word, it was in Bridge Street, which is now Pillinger Street. Oh, so there we go. So this is, oh, there it is. So that's Bridge Street there, and that's the rivulet, southern outlet, and that way literally is where um, Aldridge Lodge is, just kind of over here a wee bit. So that at one stage was all part of the same, the same property. That's the house. But Curzon didn't live long enough to truly enjoy it. He retired from practice due to ill health in 1898. He had a dodgy liver, surprise, and died in Sydney on the 16th of September, 1899. Curzon Elport died at Sydney on the 18th instant, Cecil writes the postscript to his mother Elizabeth on the 22nd of September, 1899. An account of Cecil, sorry, Curzon's funeral, published in the Mercury on the 25th of September, 1899, reads, The funeral of the late Curzon Allport took place at Queenborough Cemetery yesterday afternoon. Um, you know the Queenborough Cemetery is no longer there. Yeah, yeah, it's Hutchins. Um, <laughs> the remains being interred in the family vault there. The Reverends Bucknell and Anderson of All Saints conducted the service. The corpse was placed in a cedar, silver-mounted coffin and was borne from the late residence of the deceased in Bridge Street in a, in a hearse drawn by four horses and was followed by a large cortege comprising of 21 carriages, members of the legal profession, many leading Hobart citizens, members of the, I'm going to say this wrong, I do apologise, Antith Antithium? Oh, yes, yeah. Thank you. I knew I was going to get that wrong. <laughs> and likewise, many members of the Masonic fraternity. In his will, Curzon leaves bequests to his three children, Sybil's to be held in trust, his nieces, nieces and nephews by Minnie Reed, and his brother Evett, to whom he also leaves enough to pay the income thereof of my brother Francis Evett Allport during his life. Oh. <laughs> Evett is also left monies for the working and management of Aldridge Lodge and all lands in which they were tenants in common. Bequests are also left for his servants and the children of his gardener. He leaves nothing to his wife Annie, save what she, oh no, save what she is entitled to. It's got, he's got a favourite um, servant that he leaves money to, a female servant, says his brother. He's a nurse apparently. Um, leaves nothing to his wife Annie, save what she's entitled to under his father's will and the settlement which was made at the time of their marriage. 
Dudley, of course, is made as an executor. Cecil married Annie Campbell in 1886, and they set up home in Newbury, Elizabeth Street, and they had three children, Morton, who died in action on the Western Front in 1916, Eileen Isabel, who married Hubert Mansell Brittingham Moore, and it is through her that Cecil's family line continues, and of course, Henry Allport, founder of the Allport Library and Museum of Fine Arts. Everett Allport died unexpectedly in September 1902, and he was living at Aldridge Lodge at the time. He had never married nor had children. In 1896 to 1900, saw Dudley and Jack Allport, because it's children, enlist in the army and fight in the Boer War. Dudley's return in January 1900 was reported in the papers, including the Daily Telegraph, Launceston, where he was incorrectly named as the brother of Cecil Walport. <laughs> a correction was issued the next day. <laughs> Dudley eventually married in January 1902, and according to the family Bible, his mother Annie did not attend the wedding. His wife, Marion Louisa, she was known as Louisa, Hedberg, gave birth to their first and only child, Joan Ebert Orport, prematurely on the 10th of September 1902, a mere eight days after the death of her great uncle, Ebert. Dudley died suddenly when seized with a fit um, in September 1906. Interestingly, he was not buried in the family plot, but with his deceased former fiancée, Miss Emily Helena Hannaford, at the Queen Mara Cemetery. Um, so all their headstones have now been moved to Cornelian Bay, so they're all sort of together now. But I find that very strange. Mm -hmm. Annie Allport, Curzon's long-suffering and estranged wife, meanwhile, had remained in New Norfolk with her family. Not much is known about her life there. She seems to have disappeared from society. She remained in New Norfolk until after the death of Curzon and Dudley, when she moved into Aldridge Lodge. Stilwell claimed that um, Baldridge Lodge was actually sold to Annie, but I've never found any evidence of this, so I'm thinking that might be possibly an error. Annie did, however, live there with her daughter-in-law, Louisa, her granddaughter, Joan, and her daughter, Sibling, her daughter, Sibling, sorry, and she had an addition built so that she could look at the views of the Derwent. Stilwell is quite scathing about this addition in his oral history, and he says it ruined the 1890s architecture. <laughs> See? <laughs> He would have been shocked at what happened to it. Yeah. Um, Annie died in October 1918 and is buried in New Norfolk. Her grave is unmarked. Jack Allport, Curzon and Annie's second son, in the words of Cecil, distinguished himself by marrying a barmaid from the West Coast and leaving this colony for South Africa. <laughs> Jack died of disease in a military hospital in July 1901. He is buried in St John's Cemetery, Winburg, South Africa. Interestingly, the Launceston Examiner ran a notice on the 11th of March, 1890, which read, on the 10th of March, Mr. J.C. Incorrect, Allport, son of Mr. Curzon Allport from the firm Miss Robertson Allport, was admitted to hospital today suffering from typhoid fever. It is alleged he contracted the disease through drinking milk. <laughs> Curzon and Annie's only surviving daughter, Sybil, never married and lived at Aldridge Lodge with her sister-in-law, Louisa, her mother Annie and her niece Joan. She was hit by a car and killed while crossing Elizabeth Street near Burnett Street at 7.30 p.m. on the 5th of May, 1945. The driver was committed for trial on a charge of manslaughter. Aldridge Lodge was opened up for lodges from around the mid-1910s onwards. By July 1920, Louisa Allport, so Dudley's widow, was advertising to let furnished three self-contained flats, every convenience three minutes from tram, apply Aldridge Lodge, Elboden Place. Interesting point is that Stilwell believes that at one point, um, Dr. now Sir William Crowther lived in the flats. Now that's a whole <laughs> other story there. Crowther's in the Allports. Um, Joan inherited the home on the death of her mother, Louisa Allport, in December 1941. Over time, Aldridge Lodge fell into disrepair and Joan sold it to the university and it has been torn down. Although student accommodation, Jane Franklin Hall now sits where Aldridge Lodge once stood, you can still see the foundation stones and ruins of the old garden. Um, I believe that you can actually see there's an old stone, um, an old stone 
fountain. Pond. Fish pond. pond, thank you. Fish pond, and that's actually where um, Mary Morton's youngest son, Gordon, drowned. And I believe it's still there. He was, only, he was a young lad. He was only about four, I think. She lost two babies in the same year. When Joan died in 1986, she left many personal and family items to her friend, John Basil Waldy. And in recent years, we've been fortunate to have some of those items returned to the Allport collection by Mr. Walker's descendants. As the years passed, the two Allport collections were eventually somewhat reunited. While many items were sold off, given away as gifts, or lost to the passage of time, Joan did, con jo did contact Geoffrey Stewell after Henry's death and offered many items that belonged to Mary Morton Allport, her father and grandfather, to the Allport Library Museum of Fine Arts. This would ensure that her side was represented and then we are now fortunate enough to have some of the family's amazing personal treasures. The Curzon Allport divorce scandal of 1883 sent shockwaves through the Victorian Society of Hobart and had ramifications that impacted the Allport family for generations to come. But Curzon's line was to die out with the death of his only granddaughter Joan in 1986. Morton's line continues through his granddaughter Henry's sister Eileen's line. I like to think that there is some justice in this, that Cecil somehow bested his uncle and cousin in the end, for it is his son Henry who left us this magnificent collection and who, with Joan, tried to heal some of the wounds inflicted on their family. Thank you. Thank you.